few minutes talking about Asia and Africa to show some of the contrast that's going on. Because, and let's go back a half century. Because I go back almost a half century to the, my first uh, trip to Africa was 1952. And I worked with some people there who had been in uh, Asia. During the 1950s, you contrast Africa and Asia, virtually all of Africa, south of Sahara, was under colonial rule. The exceptions in 1950 would have been Liberia and uh, Ethiopia. Uh, you might consider South Africa an exception, but it was under white minority rule. There was no black majority rule. In 1956, the Sudan got its independence. In 1957, Ghana got its independence. In 1958, Guinea got its independence. But uh, without pointing out the country, something like 16 or 18 countries got their independence in 1960. So you see the first wave of independence in 1960. And then over the next decade or so, some East African countries with large white minorities got their independence, like Kenya, uh, uh, Uganda. I was in Uganda uh, in uh, 62, uh, just after its, immediately after its independence. Uh, Kenya got theirs in 63, and we can go down the list. Uh, and then, of course, it wasn't until uh, 1980 that Zimbabwe got its independence. Uh, Zambia and then northern Rhodesia had gotten its independence a few years earlier. Namibia, formerly Southwest Africa, got theirs in 1990. And then in 1994, you had elections uh, in elect which you elected uh, the African National Congress with Nelson Mandela becoming prime minister. Uh, so that uh, by, it wasn't until 1994 that all of Sub-Saharan Africa was under some form of allegedly majority rule. Unfortunately, in the intervening period from independence to 1994, a number of other number of countries had experienced a series of coups and counter coups, et cetera. And so uh, what was supposed to be uh, black majority rule was often uh, a black minority rule of a dictatorship over his own population. Most of the countries in which some of the worst dictatorships were in were 98, 99% uh, uh, black African, so you can't, uh, uh, so it was a dictatorship. Having said that, having said that the African countries came late to independence, by 1960, most Asian countries had their independence. If you looked if you were to compare Africa and Asia in the 1950s, you would say, as most people would say, that Asia's future was dismal. If you look at, uh, I should have had Paul put up a map of uh, Asia as well, but if you look at Asia in the 1950s, there was turmoil and warfare <coughs> everywhere. You had China in 49 finished their civil war, but not quite. In 1950, they invaded Tibet. Uh, and then you had the turmoil in the 59 to 61, where maybe as many as 30 million people died in the Great Leap Forward in China. Uh, you had the Huck Rebellion in the Philippines, uh, which was only put down literally with the help of the CIA. And the operative was named Colonel Lansdale. This is very public. It's not some surreptitious thing. Uh, but even there, when she put down the Huck Rebellion, the elected general, uh, uh, the defense minister, Masesai, as president, and in 1950, he started land reform, and in 1958, he was killed in a plane crash. Nobody I know in the Philippines believed that plane crash was accidental. And Philippines has paid for it with corruption, and I'm going to come back to that in a second. Indonesia had a very bloody, in the 40s, uh, battle with the uh, Dutch to get their independence. And after they got their independence, uh, they had been battling the province of, of Aceh 
down to the uh, tsunami, where in the post-tsunami period they were able to come to an agreement with Aceh. Uh, there was basically fighting all over. Of course, Indochina, Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos. We speak of the Vietnam War, but don't forget the French uh, from uh, almost the end of World War, a little slightly after the end of World War II in 1954, fought bloody battles. Uh, uh, Burma had serious coups. You go down through there. Malaysia had a guerrilla insurrection. So you look at Asia, and you say, this place, this place is in bloody turmoil. Okay, it's chaos, killing one another. Asia had a the highest population growth rate of any area of the world has ever had at that time, 3% a year. And so the idea was that Asians were going to populate themselves to death. I happen to be on record having uh, reviewed for journals a couple of books on Indonesia where I uh, headed up the agricultural education training and extension for the whole uh, evaluation of it for the whole archipelago in 91, 92, and then was in charge of designing $311.2 million program for them. Uh, I reviewed many a book which simply said Indonesia was a basket case, could never survive. Uh, same with uh, uh, India, came to independence in 47. There were riots. Gandhi went on a hunger strike to get the riots to stop. That stopped them for a while, but once they divided lines there, there were millions of people, uh, uh, Muslims who wanted to get into Pakistan, either East Bengal, which was then part of Pakistan, or, uh, or uh, Hindus in Nisya, which wanted to get into uh, India, although there are still, incidentally, there are still about 100 million Muslims in India. And whole trains would be attacked. Trains full of Hindus would be attacked and everyone would be slaughtered on them by Muslims. Trains full of Muslims would be attacked by Hindus and everyone was slaughtered. And so you look at it and you'd say, where is their stability in Asia? Where is their hope? And I think a lot of people concluded there was no hope. And you look at, uh, in the prior 100 years, look at all the famines they had. In 1,500 years prior, 3,000 years prior uh, to uh, 1950, there were over 1,500 major famines in China alone. Uh, you had in Bengal in 1943, uh, three, uh, six million people died of famine. Uh, in 1937, you had a major famine in China. And we don't know how many millions died, but it was well above six or seven million. And when I grew up, the standard mantra was finish your uh, spinach, finish this or that. Think of the starving children in China. There are no starving children. In contrast, in 1960, Africa was a net food exporter. Africa had something that Asia didn't have, and that it had the lowest density of population of any continent on the globe, Asia. It had, and you go to, you, you went to Asia and you saw children who were on the streets blind from vitamin A deficiency. You went to northern India and you saw people with goiter. Uh, you went to Africa, you rarely saw that kind of uh, malnutrition that led to the kind of danger there were. Africa had fairly high population growth rate, but not as high. And so there was a good deal of optimism about Africa when it came into its independence. Fifty years later, and so one would have said, what will Africa look like 50 years from now? And what will Asia look like 50 years from now? I said that in 1960. And everyone was predicting mass famine. And they kept doing it through the 60s. Uh, Paul Ehrlich is famous, and I love to give this quote and get it out of the 
The opening lines of his book, 1968, The Population Bomb, is the battle to say humanity is lost. Wow, that's a powerful opening statement. I mean, if, if, I, if I wrote that opening statement for the book, I'd say, not only uh, your question, why should you bother reading the rest of it, but why should you even bother to write it? I mean, uh, why nickel and dime your way to perdition, just go out in style. Uh, but in any case, the second line was even worse. Even crash programs would fail. And so he had predicted uh, famine. I even had it, uh, food shortages in the United States in the 70s. He predicted that in 1969, he predicted that in 10 years, the oceans would be out of fish. Uh, in 1979, he came to Woodlands and accepted a $10,000 prize as the best essay in the future. I assume it was given at a dinner. I don't know whether there was ocean fish <laughs> on the plate. Uh, I'm sorry to say that a former dean of ours, who's no longer with this institution, was responsible for refereeing these papers. And I got a bunch of them. And I uh, said none of them were worth uh, giving. But that's another story. <laughs> So mass famine was predicted. Let me give you some figures of what happened globally. And a couple of my students here in class, they've heard these figures. It doesn't hurt again. In 1960, there were 3 billion people. And during the 60s, there were projections of two, you know, population 2000 and 2000. And the low ones were about 9 billion, the highs were at above 13 billion, and most people said we have about 11 billion. Population was going rather rapidly at the time. From 1960 to 2000, the world population doubled. Food supply went up 2.7 times. In other words, there was a 35% increase in per capita food production. And the most impressive gains occurred in Asia, something we call the Green Revolution. Now, some of you may take an English course or some other humanities course where somebody who would know a rice paddy from a cow paddy, if they stepped in it, have become experts on agriculture, and they will uh, uh, tell you the Green Revolution failed. Uh, and they will give all sorts of spurious reasons the Green Revolution fed people. Uh, I was supposed to go up to Denver to, uh, with, along with, to debate alongside my son on genetically modified food crops. It was at a Unitarian church, uh, but I had spinal stenosis and had to have surgery, so I didn't make it up there. But I gave my son the figures. He gave the figures on the Green Revolution. Some woman stood up and asked him where he got his data. Well, my son's a molecular biologist, director of molecular biology for his a school of public health there, the med school of the University of Colorado. He very meticulously gave her all the sources. She couldn't accept that. She stood up, she gave a barnyard expletive and stormed out. In other words, don't confuse me with the facts. In Asia, India's food production has gone up four times since 1950. Population's gone up three times, but that is an increase in per capita food production. So that although they, there's still problems in India food, they are dramatically, have been dramatically reduced. Secondly, if you look at the last, uh, since 1980, the last 30 years, India joins other Asian countries and most of the rest of the world. The percentage of land under cultivation of the primary grains has declined as they shifted into vegetables and more diverse uh, diet. This has been a global trend. Uh, those who, uh, including uh, the grand dame of misinformation, Vandana Shiva, uh, and say monoculture there, in fact, the increases in grain yields there have allowed for diversification. Uh, so we go on then. So Asia then has transformed itself Africa has moved in the other direction. Africa is the only continent on the globe where per capita food production is fallen. Secondly, we can go into all, uh, in the 1950s, third place, a couple of quick things then. The expert opinion, of course, expert opinion was at that time, uh, people of uh, like Paul and I of either European or of European descent, 
And they said Asia will always be backwards. Why? Well, Confucianism too bureaucratic, Buddhism too otherworldly. They didn't know anything about Hinduism, uh, and they, most Americans today still think that Hare Krishna is uh, Hinduism, as one uh, Indian journalist uh, described it, is more like karma cola. Uh, it's something that raises huge amounts of money in the U.S. Uh, Islam was too militant, etc. So they, they were bogged down by bureaucracy, etc. They could never make it. Since 1950, Asia's rice production has gone up four times. And interestingly enough, they use no more water to produce it today than they did in 1960. Uh, so we could go down the list. Most important, and then we'll start talking about Africa. Asia has joined the rest of the world in bringing down its fertility rates. In fact, if people had looked underneath the data rather than looking at the top, they realized that the reason that Asia in the 1950s had such a high uh, population growth rate is because they were bringing down their death rates. And in fact, let me add a more generalization. The sole cause in terms of the global statistics of the increase in population since 1950 have been declining death rates. Over, since 1950, globally, birth rates, fertility rates have fallen at unprecedented levels. The last I checked, and it was several years ago, and there's probably more, there were 60 countries in the world with 40% of the world's population and brought their birth rates fertility rates down to 2.1, which is replacement. But even more startling, there are 35 countries in the world, most of them in Asia, that have brought their fertility rates down to less than 1.5, which means they're going to be losing population. Korea, Singapore, Japan. So that Asia does, still has a certain amount will be experiencing population growth because of demographic momentum in some areas, etc. But basically, the issue is one then that is largely under control. They're feeding themselves. Net Asia is now exporting food. Let's go to Africa then. Contrast Africa. Well, Africa started out with a number of strikes against it. And I think it explains that. African nations were artificially carved out and uh, very much recognized by the African countries themselves. And it is one of the ironies then, since those borders were uh, in 1885 when the European powers met in Berlin and literally carved up Africa amongst themselves, they were quite aware that they were dividing lines through tribal groups. They simply did not care. Uh, and so what happened is since African borders are so ridiculous in terms of ethnic populations, African countries have made what seems like a strange rule until you think about it. African countries say no border changes, period. Now they have violated that and why? Because once you start rectifying this border, rectifying that border, you're in a never-ending change there, and it would make the chaos even worse. So however bad our borders are, accept them. And uh, so we can see that the only changes have been made, two, and they've been volunteer, and that is uh, Ethiopia uh, and Eritrea split. Uh, but nevertheless, in the, one of the, the southern province of Ethiopia, Ogaden, over 95% of the population is Somali. And they have led, they've been in rebellions at various times against the government. No other African country supports them, even though it makes sense to hive off Somalia, Somali speakers because they don't want to start any border change. The other one is because you've had an on-running civil war in the Sudan, uh, they will be having an election as to whether or not the southern group so, uh, uh, will in fact be allowed to secede. They probably will vote to secede. I'm not sure whether the northern government is going to accept that. All right. African countries were born 
with very little sense of identity. They had not existed that long. Nigeria, which we think of the, the country, in 1900, Nigeria was a few enclaves. Uh, you had the Laos, uh, Lagos there. Uh, you had various provinces. You had the north. Uh, in these cases, mostly you had indirect rules where you'd sign agreements with uh, tribal leaders. Uh, so that you didn't develop a national... Uh, African countries were born without a national identity except for a few leaders. And so you didn't have a national identity and you didn't have a national loyalty. Secondly, and to contrast it to Asia, Asian countries had experienced colonialism and in their own time had experienced that, that they had a substantial number of educated people. Colleges, universities, etc. Africa had virtually none outside of South Africa. Literally, the, if you go from South Africa to the uh, north, you had no universities. Uh, in 19, uh, in the Sudan, they set up Gordon College, which eventually became the University of Khartoum. In 1946, they set up, uh, the British set up University College in Baden, Nigeria, in uh, Kampala, Uganda, Makere. And these were university colleges. They were not full-fledged universities. When I taught at the University of Khartoum, as late as 62, 63, all sophomore ex uh, exams and all uh, senior exams were sent to England. You had external examiners. I graded the exams, and then they were all shipped to England. They didn't even have their own independence. The library for the University of Khartoum, for a country which was then 13 million people, had 26,000 volumes. That was less than the University of Texas added where I come from, added each year. It was about one third of what they added each year. Even worse than that, and it shows you the sense in which they treated it, I would collected various government publications, some really excellent ones. Research had been done, and I found out that the University of Khartoum Library was not an official depository, but the British Museum was. There was all this good information, uh, and there was a different attitude, the colonialists. In India, uh, the British said India once had a great civilization, but being the con conquerors, they said, but of course the current Indians are unworthy of it, and so India, Brits became very nobly the preservation of it. But by the time you got independence, take a look at all the leading, uh, you already had, not only in India, but all over the world, leading scientists and others were Indian. And you had none of that from Africa. In uh, 1960, when Congo got its independence, a country then of around 13 to 15 million people, there was one college graduate in the whole country. One, uh, towards the end of their colonial rule, the Brits set up elite high schools in Nigeria and Ghana. And then some of those went on to university, some went overseas then. Unfortunately, those rulers, those who graduated, really didn't come to power in any place until the 1990s, et cetera. Uh, the recently, uh, uh, the most recent president of Ghana, who just uh, who's now succeeded by John Adam Mills, was the first African graduate of Ashimoto, their elite school. I've worked with many people who are graduates of the elite schools. Uh, so in other words, they started elite schools just prior to independence, and it was too late. So number one, African never had an independence. Uh, didn't have an administrative structure of any kind then. And so they made, uh, I think, some uh, number of bad policy decisions. And I think 
let me just say that policy makes a difference, and Paul would definitely agree with that. And we don't have to compare Asia to Africa. We can compare Asia to Asia and then get back to Africa. In the 1950s, you know which country in Asia had the highest rate of economic growth after Japan? Anyone guess? The Philippines had the best education system. The one thing Americans did is old Emersonians. Uh, they uh, trust thyself. The heart resounds to an iron string. Emersonians flocked uh, out there to teach at all levels and we had the best universities. The uh, University of Philippines was outstanding. Uh, and I've worked with many an Asian who got their PhD at the University of Philippines. Uh, they had the best ag school there. Uh, University of Philippines at Los Banos. And that's why you set up the International Rice Research Institute there. Filipinos remember fondly when they went to Hong Kong to get mates. And what happened? Of course, as I said, nobody believes in uh, died. Uh, the plane crash was accidental. You had uh, a series of incompetent presidents, starting with uh, uh, Diosdado Macapagal, the, pres the father of the current president, followed by the rule of, uh, of the the, the kleptocracy under Marcos, uh, etc. And now, Philippines is one of the poorer countries. Now, it's, it's not as bad as Cambodia and Laos, but it's fallen behind most other Southeast Asian countries, where it was once ahead of them. It was fallen behind Korea. In 1960, Korea had the same per capita income as India. And before the current reforms, after all, uh, uh, Tom, uh, Paul said he's a fan of uh, Singh, uh, and I guess you're a fan of Singh, not only as prime minister, but when he was finance minister in the previous thing, he began opening up of the Indian economy. Uh, but in any case, Malaysia, where I've been going, gosh, 20, over 25 years now, uh, Malaysia, I saw it. When I first started going there, the poverty rate was around 70% of the population. Now it's down to less than 5%. Malaysia in 1960 had the same per capita income as a number of East African countries. And it had half the per capita income of Ghana. Now it has 30 times that per capita income. Now, so what happened in Africa? Well, incidentally, uh, I will leave time for questions there, but if you have a question, kind of raise your hand, and when I see you have it, uh, uh, you look over there, pull your hand down, and uh, if I reach a point where I can take a break, I'll give it to you, otherwise we will uh, finish by a little before 11 and leave time for questions. So Africa had, I guess, poor administrative structure. Most of the, particularly the British countries, they left them with a good civil service. And that was important. Uh, people who knew how government functioned, and you had functioning governments. You didn't have that in Africa. And I may give a brief digression, but I think it's illustrative. Uh, the, uh, every few years, there's a meeting between European countries and Asian countries. And it shows the pragmatism of the Asian countries. The first one was in Bangkok. And uh, the Europeans said, we, we need translators. We're going to have to have set up translators because we're going to translate into 23 different languages. And the Asian comment is, haven't you all heard of English? ASEAN, a country of 10, uh, a, a grouping of 10 countries, where they speak Vietnamese, Khmer, uh, Thai, the Laotians speak, well actually the Thai speak Thai, the, the Laotians speak Northern Thai, Bahasa Indonesia, Bahasa Malay, Chinese, all sorts of different religions, all their meanings are in English. Uh, the Malaysian government, uh, government under Mahathir, all cabinet meetings were held in English. And his comment was, you can't get elected to the parliament unless you know Malay. So I know you know Malay, but you can't operate internationally unless you know English. <laughs>
And so basically they learned English, but and they had a meeting in London and Prime Minister Mahathir asked if I would attend, which I did. And Mahathir spent half the time praising British colonialism. And then the rest of the time, he then raised questions about his concerns about the common market, etc. Needless to say, the British press the next day ignored the first half and covered the second half. There's old Mahathir, as Serbic as ever. And basically, Malaysia recognizes the importance of having an administrative structure with trained and skilled people who can do things like collect taxes, uh, build roads, ports, uh, maintain law and order, etc. Uh, you need a skilled bureaucracy then. In Africa, both in French and English and Belgian rule and all of them, no African was to be at a position where he gave orders or senior then to uh, an expatriate, which means all the senior positions were uh, by, uh, by expatriates or they didn't exist. In other words, a lot of it was indirect rule. So that Africa started out uh, without a government and administrative structure. Uh, nevertheless, the first 10 years of African independence, 1967, you look at the continent, and there were positive growth both in agriculture and in urban development then. Uh, a more rapid rate of growth than it occurred under the colonial period. Uh, since 1970, though, the fortunes have turned around. A few countries in Africa have now turned that around, and I will get to them in a few minutes then. But basically, then, African countries, in dealing uh, with their problems, largely fail. One of the reasons is you had a few African leaders, many of whom had to uh, lead uh, rebellions to get it. In other words, now after the 1960s, uh, we did continue to have warfare in Indonesia, but the largest area of Indonesia was independent. Uh, you did have warfare in southern uh, Philippines, but when it really threatened the government, the Reagan uh, regime pulled the plug on Marcos. But they still have uh, problems then. And of course, you had the Vietnam War, which continued elsewhere. But you had something in Asia that you didn't have in Africa. And I would say that one of the big reasons, a major reason why Asia developed was communism. Why? If you look at the ASEAN countries, except for the Philippines, where we, the US kind of gay shielded them with uh, uh, two major facilities, our big naval base, Subic Bay, and our big Air Force Base, Clark Field. These countries were bare naked. And this, the whole idea of the spread of the Vietnam War, et cetera, you had elites then which engaged in genuine reform. I know working in Indonesia, the University of California had long, uh, the economics department had long been advising them they were known as the Berkeley Mafia. And the whole process, when I was involved in their agriculture and designing their projects, the uh, uh, very common statement was everything to the east. In other words, as you, the farther east you went, the poorer it became, and the resources were to be spun there. They had land reform. Uh, they had programs that utilized the peasants, so that basically uh, you had uh, you literally, the bank rakyat, the people's bank, set up in the villages there, lent money to people. Um, they didn't lend money to people. Quote, their credit was uh, so they could buy seeds, fertilizer, etc. They weren't given the cash, they were given the Indonesian uh, production skyrocketed, and Indonesia was not a major food exporter anymore, uh, etc. African countries started out with high ideals. Everyone was going to build universities, and they're still going. They're still building universities that they couldn't afford. Asian countries started out at the bottom level, and uh, in 1950s, uh, Korea was spending three times the percentage of its GDP on education of any country in its income class. 
African countries tried to, they, African countries decreed universal education, uh, but within years the whole the system collapsed and they simply did not have the resources to do it and to support a college system at the same time then. And so the uh, irony of it is that Asian countries today, in terms of school age population, as a percentage of their population is half that of Africa. So Africans have to spend twice the percentage of their GDP for education just as to have each individual student get the same percentage. And the fact is that Korea is 20 or 30 times the uh, uh, per capita income of African countries, some of the African countries, and it means then that you don't have to uh, you have a lower percentage of your GDP, and even that low percentage of the GDP does a hell of a lot more education. So Asian countries now uniformly have outstanding ins institutions of higher learning, but they built them up all the way. And this includes China, too. I have uh, worked there with the National Academy of Sciences and others, given seminars in Chinese universities. But let's get back to Africa because we're finding out that. Africa, therefore, one of the things is that you have coup d'etats. And a key element of development, as the World Bank says, and I think most people agree, is macroeconomic stability. Now, a lot of people have claimed evidence for the Asian miracle, et cetera, uh, when the Asians got around to demanding the World Bank do a study led by Japan there, they decided the Asian miracle was not totally free markets. Uh, Asian countries knew when to free up a certain segment of the economy, but they started out with restrictions there, they started out with government intervention, they started out with uh, reform then. Uh, and you now have, even in China, probably certain sectors of the Chinese market are among the most laissez-faire in the world. In fact, they're too laissez-faire, as you can see what happens in some of the contaminated products they sell in the United States. They could use, uh, here is the United States demanding China do more regulation. Back to Africa. And so you, you, most of Africa is like ma macroeconomic stability. Secondly, we've got the map here then. African countries have made some poor choices. They sounded good at the time. Uh, and let me just mention one of them, because one of the revered leaders, Tanzania, yeah? In 1960, all but one seat in the parliament was won by the ruling party, Tanga. Under the regime of Julius Nyerere, one of the most revered men in Africa. Very quiet, unassuming. Uh, I once talked to the U.S. ambassador there who said that meeting with Nyerere is, is strange. Because as ambassador, U.S. goes in and says, we'd like you to do something, the president, and automatically the president says, well, what are you going to do for me? That's standard. You go in and you ask Nieri to do something, and he wants to discuss it. He wants to know the ethics of it, the philosophy of it. The man was decent, and he had the power to make change. And so he went through a program of villagization and all sorts of interesting things, equality, etc., which not too long after he stepped down voluntarily, his successor went on national radio and TV had admitted that their program had failed. So in other words, there is his program. I still hear people advocating it. But not only that, but a very good friend of mine, Chris Chitsanga, a really outstanding molecular biologist, did postdoc work under Watson, spent 11 years on the faculty of the University of Michigan, uh, where uh, uh, people like Francis Collins served, et cetera, said that Nieri, after he stepped down, came and spoke to the University of Zimbabwe and he told the students, if you are promoting, trying to promote a program like I had in Africa, in Tanzania, forget it. It doesn't work. And so you had a lot of programs that didn't work. 
Uh, in Zambia, under Ankalundu, it was called humanism, uh, Afrocentrism, etc. So Africa tried to carve its own path, which was admirable, except unfortunately it carved too many wrong paths. To add to it then, Africa has been, uh, had a series of, uh, there has, uh, Africa from the beginning has never totally shaken colonial intervention. And I think the uh, classic example is Congo. At independence, the day after independence, uh, General Jensen, who was head of the Fourth Blue League, called in the officers and wrote on the board in French, uh, before independence equals after independence. Nothing has changed. Uh, a few days later, you had the start of a number of mutinies and Congo descended into chaos. Secondly, you had the Belgian mining giant, Union Minier, uh, precipitated a, uh, a uh, in uh, what was then Katanga province, a rebellion to separate that province out there so Union Minier could continue as it always had, rather than those re uh, revenues going to the central government. After all, it was the government of the Congo totally that provided the revenues uh, that had built that uh, mining area up the railroad, et cetera. But in any case then, uh, this has been continuous. Uh, particularly Southern Africa has been plagued uh, by colonial intervention. Uh, it has suffered, same areas have suffered drought one year and floods the next year. Uh, it has uh, been all sorts of things. But critically, since they locked the administrative structure, various macro global uh, programs were simply excluded Africa. The Green Revolution excluded Africa. Uh, uh, Africa is only about, uh, the Green Revolution is heavily a Green Revolution. And at the time in 1950, the, uh, the African uh, did not grow that much grain. Uh, uh, it was largely an irrigation revolution then. Around 17 to 19 percent of the Earth's uh, agricultural lands are irrigated. They produce close to 50 percent of the world's food. Uh, the big increases in food production have come on irrigated lands, uh, and including incidentally Bangladesh, who, the, that was the term basket case Henry Kissinger referred to them about. Uh, over the last 30 years, they have doubled food production. It's mostly on irrigated agriculture, high yielding crops. So science and technology was applied to food production and was simply not carried out in Africa. There was no administrative structure. Uh, well, uh, in Asian countries, you did have agricultural research stations, etc. In India, they had to be restructured. Rockefeller came in with rather sizable amounts of money. In India, also, they had to overcome opposition to it. Your agricultural minister at the time, Subramanian, I'm not the composer, uh, but uh, Plowed up his cricket pitch, and if you know anything about the Indian elite, cricket is important, and planted high yielding wheat as an example to the followers there. They uh, promoted wheat, rice, etc., and they got their Green Revolution going. And Africa has never had a Green Revolution. And so it didn't have the science and technology. In the 1950s, there was a malaria eradication campaign. Global and it basically ignored Africa because Africa did not have the administrative structure. And some of the worst malarial areas in the world were in Asia, and most of these areas are fairly clean. Malaysia, uh, no problems with malaria, etc. In fact, even the southern United States. We set up the CDC, as I told my class in 1943, the Centers for Disease Control to study malaria because we had malaria in the south and we had malaria in places like New Guinea and we wanted to know more about it to keep our troops alive. In 1950s, when we first did a uh, disease survey, the CDC couldn't believe it. We had eliminated malaria. I won't tell you how we did it except, of course, 
I will mention DDK played an important role despite the fact it's been vilified. Uh, but there was a couple other things like the TVA, this socialist process. During the midst of the war, uh, there was a coordinated effort to open the gates, drop the water levels, expose the banks where the flies had bred, uh, mosquitoes had bred, and then you could spray them and kill them. Uh, but be that as in May, we now have two to four million people died each year of malaria, 90% of them are in Africa. And 90% of those are children. So Africa has a higher disease level than any other area of the world. Asia had a high disease level, but they've been able to have the administrative structure. And so if you look at some of the diseases they had there, uh, basically they have a problem of an unhealthy labor force unhealthy population, which has now been compounded by AIDS. Uh, and there's AIDS in Asia, but they've been able much better to contain it. Uh, you go into rural southern Africa, and you will find villages where there are grandparents and children. There are 12-year-olds trying to cultivate the field. Unfortunately, they never, they didn't have adult supervision to teach them how to do it, and they were all young men. Uh, and so yeah, Africa is battling uh, disease. What else then has happened? Well, Africa has been hit by about everything. In southern Africa, you, uh, as I said, you had continual warfare in Mozambique. Once they, they got their independence in 75, but first the then Rhodesia, uh, sponsored a rebellion in the north, and when they were, uh, when uh, Rhodesia became black majority rule in Zimbabwe, South Africa picked up the support of Renamo, and it wasn't until Mandela became prime minister, a president, that there was pressure put on uh, the rebel group to have them uh, capitulate to an election, which they did, and they lost. Uh, and South Africa now, under black majority rule, uh, has played a role in saying, you guys better not go back into the bush and rebel. You, you go to parliament and you settle your differences there. Uh, one of the things then, some of the hope for Africa, briefly let me mention Mozambique, I'm very close to the government there and I'm involved in, in uh, my advising them. In the last 10 to 15 years, Mozambique, which started out as pure Marxist. And in fact, Mozambique was even a member of the, uh, what, Cameroon? In the last 15 years, they've turned it around. Among other things, they looked at the map and they saw they were completely surrounded by English-speaking countries, and so they joined the Commonwealth. They've had six to eight percent rates of economic growth since then. The problem is they started so damn low that they're still poor. But they're, they've really got, and they've got good leadership. And anyone who doesn't think that there are not excellent leaders in Africa, there are. There are a lot of absolute degenerate dictators, etc. Uh, that all, but you've, you've got some good leaders. And let me just mention Mozambique, because I work closely with them now. Uh, the Portuguese, very late in the game, started a, a high school. Uh, well, they had a high school for the Portuguese settlers, and then they let them in one or two Africans. The first African uh, to get a graduate from this high school, then go on the university, was Joao King Chisano. And then the next year was Pascual Mukumbe. Both of them went into exile to join the rebellion. Makumbe, while involved with the Prelimo rebellion and raising funds, etc., went to school in Geneva, med school, and got a doctor's degree, medical doctor's degree. He spoke a tribal language, he spoke Portuguese, he went to medical school in French, third language. I've met with uh, um, both Chisano Mukab and Makumbe. You would not know that English was their fourth or fifth language. Chisano speaks about seven or eight languages. Uh, 
Uh, Makumbe started out as a health minister and kept a small practice on the side just to keep pretend and then became foreign minister then he became prime minister and every day at seven o'clock he was at the university every weekday of uh, Mozambique and from seven to ten or more he was th taking courses in economics and he was considered the prime candidate uh, to become a uh, leader of the uh, head of the World Health Organization, and there was some internal maneuverings there, and he didn't get it. But the man is international, so you have you have some quality leaders. Nieri was clearly a quality leader, a believer in democracy, a believer in, in human rights and everything, etc. Quality leader who just made the wrong policy decision. A quality leader then who through no real fault of his own, had more power than he should have because he was so revered and his power won uh, that he was could lead his country down a path uh, that's now been reversed. Tanzania has recognized this problem there, has stable government under Kikwete, and Tanzania has been uh, experiencing a certain amount, uh, some uh, rather good economic growth out of the last uh, uh, a decade. Uh, Malawi has turned it around under Musarika uh, and uh, began its, its agriculture has improved. It's now feeding itself even though it, it is a rather tiny and uh, you might say overpopulated country. It is so small that it's mislabeled on the map. That, well, Malawi is here. This is what I thought they were pointing over there. Uh, and so you have, good, you have some good leaders in Africa. But they're still faced with enormous problems. And these problems uh, economically. Namibia has good leadership. Uh, and again, uh, and uh, one of the problems is they have a, uh, a land issue. And uh, they're trying to keep the lid on it. I don't know how long that will happen now. But of course, under South Africa, the big farm, the farms were heavily uh, wide open. A German, as it had been in German Southwest Africa before uh, the public, uh, public of South Africa uh, got it. Uh, and so you have, I can go through, Ghana has excellent leadership now. And also Ghana has oil wealth. And there's concern, will Ghana suffer the, uh, the Dutch disease? That oil wealth is just coming on stream, just as Ghana had uh, righted its economy. In many ways, it did it in ways I would disapprove. They had a whole long history of corruption. A Lieutenant Jerry Rawlings led a rebellion. And literally, the prior leaders, they put him on trial for corruption and took him out and shot him. Uh, then he held elections and then went back into the military and the new group was no better than the old group and literally there was a popular uprising of the soldiers. He had been arrested, they freed him from jail and he went and came back into power. Now, I don't favor shooting uh, corrupt people, but it certainly got Ghana's attention. And under Rawlings, whatever did right or wrong, the economy started picking up. Uh, under his successor, who was the first graduate of Hashimoto, it got even better. Uh, and now Ghana's had a very, uh, an economy which is experiencing uh, decent rates of economic growth. And they've got a huge amount of oil coming on stream. Uh, and the question is, what will they do with that wealth and how will they use it? I could go also, but then we can have countries like Nigeria. And one of the, one of the final problems, and then we'll open it up to questions, or if there are no questions, I'll continue. Uh, you can speak about the different ethnicities in Asia. In, Malay, in Indonesia, we talk about all the different languages, etc. But across the archipelago, virtually everyone speaks some form of Malay. So you could have a national language called Bahasa Indonesia. In Malaysia, you could have Bahasa Malay. And interestingly enough, 
At one point in their history, they started teaching primary school in Malay. And around 10 years ago, they set up a commission. This is how pragmatic Asians can be from North Africa, under a good friend of mine, Nordin Sopi, that decided that they were cheating Malaysian students because after they'd gone through a school system in Malay, then they have to go to universities in English because everything that's really important is written in English and very little is in Malay. And so they decided then to switch their school system back to instruction in English. So that by the time their students became proficient in the international language. So they don't have an inferiority complex. Now, not that Malaysia doesn't try and do all sorts of things. Their slogan is Malaysia Belay. Malaysia can't. And if two Malaysians climb Mount Everest, it's a front page newspaper. And they have a, a station in the Antarctica, even though it's a tropical country split by the equator. Uh, so they do all sorts of things from Malaysian pride, but they don't have an inferiority complex. I think there's a certain amount of that. The uh, racism and oppression of the colonial period, I think, has left a lasting legacy. It's not an excuse. There are now today hopeful signs, Mozambique, uh, whatever the turmoil of South Africa is. South Africa, and one of the problems when you inherited a police force, you inherited a police force didn't engage in policing, they engaged in repression. And there's a difference between policing and repression, and they've yet to develop the, except anti-corruption, the anti-corruption police are outstanding, but the rest of them still haven't brought sufficient law and order. Namibia is stable, I could, uh, Zambia now uh, uh, has uh, turned it around. Tanzania has turned it around, Malawi has turned it around, Ghana has turned it around. So there are a variety of countries in Africa <coughs> uh, in which they are now experiencing positive economic growth. And in fact, during the decade of the 90s, overall, for the first time since independence, the African continent as a whole had positive economic growth. They've got to handle their agricultural problem. Let me finish that. Uh, the Gates Foundation pouring billions in there, as is Sorrow, and uh, even Buffett has given some of his money then, to transform African agriculture. And uh, let me go over my posed limit then, because it applies to things that you'll see on KUHT, et cetera, all sorts of nonsense in the chronicle food section. Africans are practicing organic agriculture. And 85% of the agricultural lands in uh, Africa, they're taking more nutrient out of the soil than they're putting back in. They're mining the soil and yields are falling. Why? Because there are parts of Africa where the price of fertilizer is five to six times the pork price because of lack of infrastructure. And poor seeds. The Gates Foundation is trying to come in there and get fertilizer. In fact, that's what Malawi's Big, uh, it's had a revolution in food production because you had a government in Malawi is compact enough and has a road system into it to, uh, to provide fertilizer and seeds, etc. They're trying to get fertilizer into the, they're trying to get good seeds, etc. Trying to have a green revolution. And there are a bunch of idiots. Uh, I would use stronger terms who are in groups called NGOs. And I could name them, but I need not. Those of you who've had my class know my absolute total contempt for them. Who are, the, the whole idea of a green revolution for Africa is important to them. Africans don't need that. They need organic agriculture. They're doing it. Uh, and uh, I <coughs> recommend uh, the uh, book by, uh, books by people like Robert Parlberg and others who have shown that uh, and then uh, that basically outsiders. Now it's no longer the colonial oppressors, it's the, all these kind of do good, allegedly do good environmental and other groups trying to save Africa. Uh, and the only thing they're, they're uh, going to do is perpetuate poverty. Fortunately, let's hope that Gates wins. They're spending billions on. Uh, uh, egg, fighting AIDS, they're spending billions uh, bringing up agriculture. Because let me make a final comment. If you look at area from Mozambique on through here, 
Africa has a tremendous area that is basically uncultivatable. It is comparable, well, it's five after, to the Campo Cejado of Brazil. In fact, Brazil, uh, World Bank has a study which shows what Brazil did, and I was in the Campo uh, Cejado, uncultivatable, and yet they came up with crops that would, could be cultivated, and of course, Brazil is now a major export of soybeans, wheat, etc., and that they could do what Brazil did to that area. So Africa has land, it, it needs resources, it needs infrastructure, etc. It's going to be very difficult, but at least there's hope. Any questions? Um, I know you didn't, you didn't really address it, but a couple, of maybe a month ago, I, I downloaded a, a, a lecture uh, off iTunes from the Center of Strategic Studies, and there was an article. What studies? Uh, the Center for Strategic Studies is yeah. from that. The, the, Institute, whatever they are, and there was an article on foreign affairs, pretty much the same thing. It was talking about how uh, is the future of, of America's military front in Africa in regards to like Libya and Somalia, uh, in regards to like the future yeah. war. What is what's your take on that? I, well, I listened to both of them, but incidentally, the Pearlberg book is called Star for Science. Somalia is an interesting case because Somalia in the 1960s would have been the home. Well, uh, Somalia started out with a democratic government, and it was the first government in Africa in which you had an election and the opposition party won and took power. And then you had a coup, uh, and South Africa liked that guy, and so did the U.S., and so we supported him. And he ran an impressive, repressive government, and one of the things repressive governments do is they don't want people to get educated, they don't want them to get capability, etc. So when they go, uh, remember Louis XIV, après moi, le déluge, but at least it wasn't quite that way in France. They had an ongoing civil service, but that is the attitude of most of the dictators. They, they eliminate all opposition. They, they uh, uh, The competent people who can get away go into exile. And then once they've been gone, they say, why in the hell should I come back? Uh, because if they're competent, many of them are, are doing well in other countries. And so they don't uh, come back. So Somalia may be our, uh, uh, our next front there because it's total chaos. No structure, nothing left. Interestingly enough, mm -hmm. the part that used to be British it's called, was called uh, uh, the you, uh, British Somaliland. The uh, part that is now Somali is called, was called Italian Somaliland. Uh, basically, these countries, uh, the, the British North, when it used to be the British North, has effectually seceded. And they're living a relatively stable existence. They're not prospering, but they're, but they're not killing one another, they're not dying in the streets. So there's nothing, you can't say it's Somali culture, etc. There are Somali-speaking peoples uh, who are, have a functioning government uh, with all this terrorism. But the thing is, the vast majority of the Somali people don't want these thugs. It is largely. But they don't, uh, once you have chaos, you have chaos, and uh, those with the AK 47 rule. Uh, so, again, let me mention another country because I work closely with Uganda. Uh, it, from 1962 to 1980s, early about 83, 84, it was on a continual downhill slide. Uh, under uh, uh, Yoweri, Kaguta, Museveni, it has turned it around, and it, it has uh, uh, some years 6, 8 percent growth, some years 2, 3, 4 percent growth. But it has had positive economic growth uh, in the 24 years that he's been in power. Now again, uh, he keeps holding elections and then changing the constitution since he can be re-elected, re uh, which is not this. I, I work with him, I better not say anymore. Uh, but let me just say this, Chisano served two terms under the Constitution of Mozambique and stepped down. Uh, 
Sandra Shomo served two terms under the Constitution in Namibia, got the Constitution changed, was re-elected for a third term, and then stepped down. Well, uh, he stepped down. Voluntarily, <coughs> not pushed out. In fact, Nujoma right now is going to law school. Of all things, somebody in some ways is going to law school. Uh, so, I mean, you do have cases where you have constitutional government and an orderly transition of power. Uh, and uh, this is just, uh, so there, again, there's hope then. Uh, maybe Museveni's right, he's unique. He, uh, population still supports him, but I was in Indonesia. Population supported Suharto because he led them out of chaos into relative prosperity. But then when the financial crisis hit, Boo Hartu, they call Boo being a term of respect, Hartu, etc. cetera, uh, Father Hartu, Father Suharto, uh, their allegiance just collapsed. And he was ushered out of power rather unceremoniously. Uh, not, uh, uh, three minutes. Uh, I had a question. Uh, Asia seems fortunate in getting good dictators. Good, good what? Good dictators. Park Chung Hee, the, yeah. the Chiang Kai shek family, Deng Xiaoping, um, the guy in Singapore. Um, you just yeah. spoke positively of Suharto. <coughs> uh, how come Africa doesn't get these good dictators? Uh, that's. I think that's a very good question. I mean, General Park used to call in the business leaders more regularly and say, what have you done for me? And what he meant was, what have you exported? Mm -hmm. uh, and Korea uh, did transform itself through manufacturing. Most people don't realize that in 1960, the number one export of poor countries was raw commodities. And uh, they complain because of changing But is, has there been Today a, it's now manufactured. Has there been the equivalent of the Park Chung Hee in, in Africa? Musa. Musa Vani. Musa uh, I don't want to say he's a dictator. He gets re-elected, but he keeps a firm hand on things. Uh, and, uh, but the problem is holding the country together because you have different tribal groups that speak distinctive languages. One, uh, uh, even India, with its multiplicity of languages, carved it, recarved up the states, made linguistic areas, etc. Uh, allegedly, Hindi was to be the national language, and English was to be phased out. But they'd never really done it, and people still speak in English in the parliament. There, uh, it is the lingua franca, etc. Uh, yeah, you can name uh, any number of them that were effective authoritarian leaders. So I believe in democracy. But then when you see democratic governments that are just totally a mess, and then you see authoritarian governments, and incidentally, Taiwan. Talk about chaos. In 1946, there were bloody riots in Taiwan, the indigenous Taiwanese against the uh, Han Chinese, which was Chiang Kai-shek's group, even before he had moved his entire army there. So that you couldn't find really a place in Asia that had economic stability, had political stability, the people weren't killing one another. And Africa was relatively calm at the time. Then 1960, things started changing. And so I don't know how you do it. Not only that, but you've had uh, the leadership in Vietnam. Uh, you had Le Duong, uh, who was really ran the show after uh, Ho Chi Minh died. In fact, even before he died, he was more or less running things. Uh, he died in the 86, before Ho Chi Minh died, in 86. And Vietnam that had famine turned it around. They had the Doi Moi, the renovation policy. Uh, so they went from famine by 1990, three years later, they were exporting rice. Three years later from that, they were the second largest exporter, third largest exporter in the world. Today, they're the second largest exporter of the world, although the largest produce and export of soluble coffees. You can go down the list then. Uh, On that note, because we've run out of time, I would like to take this opportunity to thank Professor DeGregory for such a stimulating. Uh, Unfortunately, you have a number of students who've had it out before. One, two, three. <laughs> yeah, yeah.
Well, they, they didn't hear it in such a condensed format, so. But thank you very much, Tom. Yeah. I sure appreciate They've it. heard the grazing stuff that is not in, not in the uh, version you have that will be in a version you'll get soon. Examples of things that are not in the version you have that will be in a version you'll get soon are a button called EFA, I'm going to use it right now, and a button called Bifactor, which doesn't even work properly in this version, which is a quick way to set up Bifactor models, um, which I would do the hard way if I had time. The EFA button um, has very little in it. Um, it just has a check mark that says do exploratory factor analysis and then a choice of four rotations. And that's all you're allowed, okay? If you want to do exploratory factor analysis. In this case, two dimensions won't really hurt. Um, I am gonna cut quadrature so I get done, although this isn't really such a good idea in practice. Um, This is Bach Aiken. Uh, and uh, it's flying because I changed it to 21 quadrature points. Um, it's going to converge about now. Uh, I told you. <laughs> and uh, so you're doing these second order moments and whatever. It just did a quick exploratory factor analysis of this which turns out, actually, startlingly enough, to be not too shabby. Uh, remember, we know what the answers to this thing are, which is this is the first 11, one kind of adjectives, the second 11 or the other, and they're correlated. Uh, if you come down this in loadings, it's 9782969, so on down to, down, to, down to here, and after calm, it's 0 0.50 negative little, little numbers. Uh, can you see these numbers? Can't conveniently make them bigger. But over here, after calm, there are 0.9s and 0.8s. Above it, there are zeros. It's got a correlation of negative 0.39. Remember, the signs of exploratory factor analysis things are arbitrary. So who cares about that? So anyway, the next version will have this. The way it did this is it actually did compute, in this case, tetrachorics, or in another case, polychoric correlations among the items. And then it did principal axis factor analysis, otherwise now known as unweighted least squares. Uh, and then it converted the results of that into starting values for the maximum likelihood algorithm. Um, and then it fixed enough of the slopes to identify the model. <clears throat> in the case of two factors, just one. So you've got one slope, which is fixed at 0.5 and has a standard error that is not a standard error because that parameter wasn't actually estimated. A model ident identifies the model. And then you get a set of slopes. that are slopes on dimensions that you don't know what they are. They're sort of the remains of this principal axis factor analysis. Then if you want anything interpretable, you have picked one of the rotations. In this case, direct Cordyman sort of gives you what you want, which is this answer. And you look only at the rotated solution. Um, and, and you're done. There are some other things in there. Um, that have not been shown, for instance, in options. Um, this bit down here is not in the version you have. This is the uh, least size two-tier trick. Um, or if you're doing Bach Aiken EM and you've got one of these models, this by actually you can do bifactor with this. But um, this is the more general version. If you wanted to do bifactor, you check, apply dimension reduction, leave this one, and it's, bifac it's bifactor. Your model needs to follow the rules, one general factor, and each item loading on only one more factor. And it will fit, even if it's got eight dimensions, it will only use two dimensional quadratures. So that will work. Thing is, this is lead size generalization. So if it was that 34 asthma item example I showed you, which was kind of bifactor if I made the two factors general, and then after that, 
the remaining six of the eight factors had only one. I could check apply dimension reduction, change this number to two, and it would do the eight-dimensional problem as a three-dimensional problem, okay? The, um, I don't know if this will crash the program or not. Um, the way this box works, this is the bifactor box. And if you just put a bunch of items in and you want to do a bifactor model, the way it is supposed to work uh, is a bifactor model has every item loading on the first factor. You come into this box, it's got a pull down menu here that says factor two. You slide over whichever items are going to be factor two into that one. Then pull the pull down menu down to the next one. Slide over the next block of items. Pull the pull down menu down to the next one. All this does is goes to the trouble of uh, setting up the constraints. Um, see, all it is is faster than if you had something eight eight factors wide, and you wanted to make this whole thing red and then have those three on, have loadings on the, the next factor, those four on the next factor, those four on the next factor. It just saves you the trouble of going through and mousing all that to get a bifactor model. Because it's easier with bifactor to say which, which items are on the factor than to say which items aren't. But it's just a, the bifactor button is just a shortcut to constraints. EFA is a shortcut to the starting values and rotation. Um, the uh, dimension reduction thing in, in options there is uh, a shortcut to two tier. And all these tricks sort of get, get combined. There are little notes there, 27. Um, And uh, those are the things that aren't in the version you've got now. Hopefully soon we'll have a beta that I consider an improvement over the one you've got now. And then you'll have a beta that can do a little bit, little bit more. We appreciate your tolerance with the beta. I know there's a lot of stuff it doesn't do, a lot of stuff that's weird. Anyway, I think I've probably about talked myself out. Uh, Really answer questions, but I think I'm not going to say any more. Questions? After three hours, you just want out. 